Greetings everyone, Kalispera says, good evening. Uh, it appears that we'll be entering another lockdown again, um, just after midnight. However, uh, don't be concerned, lockdown or low lockdown, no matter what the circumstances, will continue to keep you to keep your company with the Greek community's uh, weekly seminars every Thursday evening. Over the next few months, the Greek community in Melbourne will be ramping up its activities, so stay tuned to all the various uh, announcements. Um, most likely, Live at the Greek will be commencing uh, uh, on Friday evenings. Um, we're hoping to stage a Writers' Festival uh, sometime in September. And also look out for the Flavours of Greece, a gastronomic extravaganza which will move from restaurant to restaurant. Had a good start this week at Philolene on Tuesday, and um, there'll be uh, many more um, later on in uh, weeks and months to come. Also this week, the school term has commenced. There are myriad of courses offered by the Greek community of Melbourne, so no matter what your age or what your level of Greek proficiency, there's always some suitable course on offer. Um, just call the office and we'll advise you appropriately. Now let's turn our attention to tonight's seminar, The Greek Revolution in the Middle East. And can I remind you all, uh, those that are following us on Facebook or YouTube, we do monitor the comments and chat, so we will be conveying your viewpoints uh, at the end of the session. If one excludes the uh, uh, machinations of the Odessa-based Filikiteria or the push in the Moldavian and uh, Valachian principalities to incite insurrection, the Greek War of Independence is, is presented generally in the national narrative as one taking place within the confines of the borders of the modern country of Greece, especially southern Greece, or what was referred to then as Moria and Arumili. However, the War of Independence... Greece's liberation struggle had profound reverberations and was deeply felt among all Christian Ottoman subjects, especially the Orthodox adhering populations in the Middle East, in the Levant. Tonight's presentation will examine attempts made by Greek revolutionaries to raise parts of Syrian revolt against the Ottomans. And again, uh, it's a pleasure to have with us our local polyglot, Dean Kalimnio. When I think of Dean, um, the analogy that comes to mind is the joke about the accountant. When asked, what's two plus two? The accountant replies, what would you like it to equal? Dean's the same, but a bit more, actually much more ethical. When asked, what's the topic tonight? He'll reply, what do you want it to be? As there are very few topics under the sun where he's not well versed on, or at least he can bluff his way through. Uh, tonight's topic is a perfect example. He has a knack for niche topics and obscure themes. As you all know, Dean wears many hats, has numerous vocations and interests that continue to grow. His latest achievement is as a children's book writer with the upcoming release of uh, Simela and the Magic Kemenji um, uh, next month. Um, I sincerely wish him um, every success. Enough for me. Dean, the floor and the mic is yours. Uh, thanks, uh, Nico. And uh, what can I say? Um, I'm flattered, but then again, I know that you say that to all the girls. But thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. It's uh, great to be here to discuss this topic with you, which is an interesting topic, I think, because as uh, Nick said from the outset, we tend to view the Greek Revolution through Hellenocentric eyes. Um, you would be forgiven for doing so. After all, it is the Greek Revolution. But when you define the word Greek, as uh, it pertains to revolution, what we generally do is consider it to take place within the narrow confines of what is modern Greece, as Nick said, Moria and a little bit of Stereo Lava to begin with. But the actual understanding of a Greek of the natural area in which the Greek identity evolved is much broader than the, uh, the boundaries of modern Greece. And tonight we're going to talk about the Middle East, but especially and specifically greater Syria, which is the area of uh, Lebanon, Syria and Palestine, and specifically Beirut, which is a very important place uh, in Greek history. It was the center of legal learning in Byzantium. And um, it is an interesting topic because up until recently, you had all these refugees from Syria coming to seek uh, solace and asylum and uh, assistance in Greece. Well, in 1821, it was the other way around. It were the Greeks who felt the need to uh, 
speak to the Syrians, to enter into dialogue with them, to seek their assistance, and uh, to ultimately um, come up with an ill-founded campaign which had unforeseen circumstances for the whole region. So the first thing we need to discuss is the fact that Islam, as practised and understood by the Ottomans, um, tended only to distinguish between religions and not nationalities. Uh, nationality was an irrelevant unknown concept, if you like. Um, Ottomans considered followers of one religion to be the millet, the nation. And thus, with the onset of the uh, Greek Revolution, all Orthodox Christians, wherever they were, whatever language they spoke, were considered the Rum millet, the Roman millet. So in there, we've got Greeks, we've got Albanians, we've got uh, Vlachs, we've got Bulgarians, we've got Serbians, we've got Romanians, we've got Arab speakers who are Orthodox and Syriac uh, Aramaic speakers who are also uh, Orthodox. All these people in the mix are considered to be uh, one people. Now, some scholars suggest that at the time of the revolution, 40% um, of the population of greater Syria was Christian, may have been less, but there are some of the statistics, and 25% of those belonged to the Greek Orthodox Church. So they were considered to be Rum. Um, as a result, the Arab and Syriac-speaking Orthodox were considered to be Rum, that is Greek, and for that reason, Syria did not escape punitive measures. And the Greek Revolution came in a sensitive time in the area, just two years earlier, the uh, Maronite Patriarch led an insurrection of 6,000 peasants against the Ottomans, and that was in protest against high taxation. The Maronites, we need to say, were a sect that were originally created by the Emperor Heraclius during Byzantium. There was a conflict between the, mono the uh, Monophysites and the Orthodox, and he tried to find the middle way and invented the monothelite heresy. These are people that espouse that Jesus and God had one will. That didn't help anyone. There were just a few people uh, on Mount Lebanon who espoused that. They were the Maronites, and uh, eventually they joined the Catholic Church, and they're still affiliated to the Catholic Church today. They were mostly Syriac-speaking for much of their history. So they rebelled, and the Ottomans put down that rebellion just two years before the revolution, and the Ottomans we must remember, harboured memories of a Western nation uh, forging through the region in recent times, and that was Napoleon's armies in Syria. So they really, really feared that that was going to happen again, and they were very, very jumpy and very, very nervous. They assumed that all Orthodox were disloyal to the empire and were looking for an excuse to revolt. So everyone was suspect. They believed that the Orthodox of Syria were champing at the bit to join the Greek Revolution and that they would rise up and join it. So, you know what, you all look Orthodox and all you Orthodox look the same as the saying goes. Yeah, we've heard that before. So 1821 comes and uh, the Ottomans issue an order that all of the Christians of Greater Syria should be disarmed, and that's to stop revolt. In Jerusalem, the city's Christian population which was about 20% of the city at the time that we're told, uh, were also forced to wear black, um, hand in their weapons and help improve the city's fortification. So they were waiting for an attack. Um, and just as the ecumenical patriarch, uh, Gregorio Sopemptos, uh, Gregory V, was uh, executed in Constantinople, so too did the Ottomans order the execution of the patriarch of Antioch, Seraphim, um, but local officials neglected to carry out these orders. It was a very heady time. Now, at the same time, there's a sort of a civil war being fought in the mountains of Lebanon. Um, the various uh, pashas who are controlling the various villages and regions, the Ayalets of Syria, are engaged in turf wars about who controls which village, and as a result, what kind of taxes you can extract from each one. Um, the victims, as, as a result, they're fighting, and the victims of the wars are generally the Christians because they're easy targets. You can loot them, you can pillage them, you can uh, murder them with impunity. So that's going on. And the victims were generally Orthodox Christians, although some of the major players in the struggle, as we'll see later on, are these Maronite Christians, uh, one in particular who we'll encounter soon, and the Druze, 
And the Drews are very interesting and very important players in tonight's story because uh, they belong to a syncretic monotheistic religion which combines elements of Islam, Zoroastrianism, there's a Druze right there, um, Gnosticism and Neoplatonism. Uh, in order to maintain control of their area, the Maronite leader Bashar Shahab uh, sought the intervention of the leader of Egypt, uh, Muhammad Ali, who we know, there he is, um, whose main aim was to uh, take over the area. Now, we remember that Muhammad Ali was, before the boxer, was an actual Albanian from Kavala who managed to get himself declared leader of Egypt and eventually broke Egypt away from the control of the Ottoman Empire. And you'll also remember his son, who's, who plays an important role in tonight's story, Ibrahim Pasha, the butcher of uh, Moria. Now, finally, in the aftermath of tonight's story, which is about a daring Greek landing in Beirut, various Greek Orthodox holy sites, such as the monastery, the monastery of the Panagia in Balamand, located just uh, south of the city of Tripoli in Lebanon, it's an extremely important center of Orthodox spirituality, even today, uh, was subjected to vandalism and revenge attacks, and the monks of Balamand were forced to abandon their monastery until 1830. So, Basically, the period that we're discussing, we're looking at tonight, Lebanon and Syria are in chaos because of the civil strife and life for Orthodox Christians is absolutely miserable, unpredictable, miserable, and dangerous. So what happens is that a Lebanese monk somehow meets with the Montenegrin freedom fighter, Vasos Mavrumunyotis, uh, Montenegrin, so Serbian speaking. One of the few guerrilla fighters, Phil Hellenes, who came down to Greece to fight against the Ottomans, who was not defeated by Ibrahim's uh, Egyptian forces. As we know, Ibrahim swept through the Peloponnese and he was going to do a bit of ethnic cleansing. He was going to get rid of all the Greeks and repopulate the Peloponnese with uh, Falahin from Egypt um, and just swept all the Greek fighters uh, in his path because they were all fighting. They had never come across such an organized, efficient army before. Uh, it almost, he almost destroyed the Greek revolution. Now, Vasos Mavrounyotis is an interesting guy and it's worth spending some time um, discussing him. Uh, in 1821, he led a force of 120 Montenegrins and Greeks and joined the uh, revolution, as we said. His first stop was central Greece, where he paired up with uh, Nikos Griesiotis from Suli, an old warrior, uh, leader of the Greek revolution in Evia. And in 1822, he participated in the fight against the Turks in Athens, where he showed bravery, was widely accepted as one of the greatest fighters of the period. So in 1824, a uh, Greek civil war erupts, and Mavrunyotis smells which way the wind is going, which is a hard thing to do because of the so many warring factions, joins forces with the government comprised mainly of Greeks that he already knew and had fought with. It's that mateship network kind of thing happening. Um, and because he chose the right side, the, the side that, that eventually won the domestic uh, strife, he was assigned the rank of general and was given a force of one and a half thousand men. Now, in the future, in the 1830s, he would go on to become a member of the elite uh, that surrounded the first uh, king of Greece, Otto the Bavarian, this lovely gentleman here with the epaulets and the youthful looking uh, um, visage. He became a member of both the Privy Council he was the adjutant to uh, Otto, and he died in 1847, was widely uh, admired by the Greek people as one of the leaders of the cause, one of the leading figures of the independent state. Um, during, famously during his career, uh, he uh, had a um, leading role in 36 battles and suffered many injuries, including a wound to the chest. And he also married into the Pangalos family, the famous political family, as you do when you're a general and you've done very well for yourself, even though you're a Montenegrin. But all that's in the future. I bring you back to the monk. The monk house sometimes somehow finds Mavrugnotis and tearfully outlines the various outrages that the Ottomans are committing against the Syrian Christians. And he begs Mavrugnotis, you have to come and do something. You have to liberate us. Now, Mavrugnotis, in turn, relays this to his political master, the wily Epirot uh, Ioan Skoletis, doctor of Ali Pasha of Yanina, fomenter of strife, prime minister of Greece, and most significantly, the founder of the Megali Idea, this idea that uh, Greece 
must comprise of all of the areas which historically the Greek people throve in. And it was the idea that we had to reconquer Constantinople and all the other areas of Byzantium in order to establish a proper Greek state. So very uh, important idea. It's, it was an idea which characterized Greek foreign policy right up until the disaster of uh, 1922 and its legacy still with us uh, today. So Coletius considers this and he has an epiphany. There's the Greek civil war raging. At the same time, Ibrahim is sweeping across Moria, imperiling the Greek revolution. So how do we save ourselves? Coletius says, why don't we hit the soft underbelly of the Ottoman Empire? And where is the soft underbelly? Syria. What if we somehow affect a landing in Syria, possibly raise revolt in that region, and as a result, we draw attention away from Moria, gives us time to regroup, gives us time to breathe, and uh, possibly somehow we'll survive. It's an interesting, audacious, bold plan by an audacious, bold, and thoroughly fascinating man. So at the same time, Coletis, who runs one of the most sophisticated intelligence networks of all of the Greeks in the revolution, is speaking or corresponding with various people on the ground, and he's aware of the fights and the rivalry between the Pashas, and he thinks the time is right. He thinks Syria is in chaos. He can exploit that chaos, and he's starting to talk to some of the major players. So what does he do? He approves of an expedition and uh, appoints with Mavrov Bunyotis, uh, an epirate captain, Hadzi Michaelis Dalyanis, who's also an interesting figure. He was born in Epiros, uh, and there are a number of areas uh, which claim to be his birthplace, Delvinaki, Argyrokasto, Premeti, uh, Himara, that be as it may. He's an apodimos. He's a Greek abroad because he grew up in Trieste where his father was a merchant. Um, he had a classical education, which is uncharacteristic for a uh, freedom fighter. And uh, in 1816, he became a member of the famous Greek uh, revolutionary secret organization, the Filiki Eteria. And by this stage, when Coletis has asked him to go on this mission, he is already corresponding with the Emir of uh, Lebanon, Bashir Shahab. This gentleman with a long beard here, beard that would rival even the most religious of patriarchs, I think. Now, Bashir Shahab was a most remarkable figure, very historical figure, very important figure, and a strange figure. He was a Muslim convert to the Maronite religion. You don't get that very often. And imagine the strength of a man who can turn his back on his religion and to apostatize in the Islam of the day meant death and espouse the Christian religion for his own reasons. He's a seasoned and wily diplomat. Um, he refused to aid Napoleon during Napoleon's sojourn in Syria, uh, especially his siege of uh, Acre. And ultimately, historians believe that he was the cause. His failure to cooperate to assist Napoleon was the cause of Napoleon's uh, failure in Syria. A year prior to the Greek uh, expedition, he had collaborated with the Ottomans in uh, removing the rival Druze Jumblat family from uh, Mount Lebanon. And being beholden to the Ottomans for his position, it's unclear what, if any, advantage a Greek rebellion in his territory would have been to him, with uh, scholars speculating that he possibly hoped that a landing would give him further leverage because he was aware that uh, Muhammad Ali in Egypt wanted to invade Syria at some stage. So he thought that if he can play one off against the other, show that you know he had a bit of clout as well, that might have assisted him somehow, um, counter lever to Muhammad Ali. And he was right because Muhammad Ali eventually conquered Syria in 1821. Now, what we see here is a map. Uh, the blue bit, that's Mount Lebanon there. The blue bit is where the Maronites are situated on the mountain, and then the yellow bit is where the Druze tribes are situated, and you can see that they are vying for very similar contiguous territory, and they are rivals, and the Greek army is about to land its way into that mess, as we'll see. That's in the future. So, in uh, on the 18th of March in 1826, uh, after first having landed in Cyprus in order to loot and pillage, because that's what a lot of Greek revolutionaries did, um, that's how they paid their troops. A flotilla of about 15 Greek ships, so not a small force, pretty decent-sized force, 
for the small um, Greek revolutionary army of its day, led by Mavrovunotis and Dalyanis, lands in Beirut. And we know what they did because their exploits are documented by the Izmirna-born British consul, John Barker, who was stationed in Aleppo in Syria, uh, in a memo to the British ambassador, Stratford Canning in Constantinople. Uh, Barker views the landing more as an act of piracy, given that the Greek pirates were renowned for such types of raids in the Mediterranean. And indeed, Greek piracy is a, uh, is a section of the Greek history and the revolution history, which is often neglected. And I think it shouldn't be. We should be looking into that. The other thing we should be looking at is into the medical history of the Greek revolution, because arguably more people died of plague, infectious diseases and hunger than from conventional battles. But that's another story. So he reports that the Greek assailants, and I quote, scaled part of the defense walls while ships cannonaded the town. Now caught off guard in the absence of all regular military force and with a very scanty supply of firearms and ammunition, the fort that was supposed to secure the town from sea invasion was as ill provided as the inhabitants. However, resistance surfaced uh, thanks to a local mufti, uh, Imam who distinguished himself in instructing and animating the townspeople to defend Beirut. The fighting resulted in casualties. Um, the uh, consul mentions 40 deaths, while the besieged suffered 14 killed and 20 wounded. And the town did incur some damage from 500 cannonballs, of which two struck the French consular house and three of the Austrian agent. So these ships were equipped with cannons and they did fire on the town. Now, the Greek invaders were rebuffed, but they didn't immediately depart. They took refuge uh, near the seashore, occupying, as John Barker describes, a number of detached houses in the silk grounds, these being chiefly inhabited by Christians. Um, and because they were Christians, he says, the Greeks did not injure them. The attackers, according to uh, one of Barker's sources appealed to the Christians to rise up and join them. And he said, he says this, if so, they must have entertained a most erroneous idea of the number and power of the Christians in Beirut. And that's the running theme behind this story. The Greeks had no idea what they were getting themselves into. There was poor intelligence. They made certain assumptions about the Greeks of the area and their sympathies and their ability to rise up, which turned out to be factually incorrect. Hence the fact that this was botched from the outset. And we also need to make another point. Um, Greek mercenaries were prominent among Russian forces, and this is something that we generally don't consider, that occupied Beirut and parts of greater Syria between 1772 to 1774, when the Russians were trying to assist local forces led by Egypt's uh, autonomous ruler, Ali B. Kabir, who was in open rebellion against the Ottoman Empire. Um, does that sound familiar? You know, Russians often do this. They tell you to revolt, and then they say they're going to help you, and then everyone knows what happens. Now, the expedition of the Russians was led by General Adjutant Rizos, who's the gentleman you see before you on the screen, uh, a Greek who was in the Russian Navy and who, upon landing in Beirut, gave the defenders a 24-hour uh ultimatum to fly the Russian flag and pay tribute because loot and pillage is what they do best. Now, that naval offensive lasted for five days and involved a very unsuccessful assault by a landing party on the 21st of June. After two days of really, really heavy bombardment, they finally landed in Beirut on the 23rd of June and spent hours sacking the town, looting its bazaar, and uh, about 550,000 kurosh of loot were taken, both in trade goods and cash. Um, cash is king, as they say. And they also extorted a good deal of cash from the Emir of Mount Lebanon, a Druze tribal leader who just happened to be called Yusuf Shahab. And Yusuf Shahab was the father of Bashir Shahab of the long beard. So you can see, A, how very complicated Middle East politics are. B, how mistrustful the populace would have been of another landing having seen it all before, it had happened before. And because eventually in typical Ottoman style, even though the Russians had landed to uh, help Ali Bey, they left and told him, sort it out with the Ottomans on your own. Russians are good at that. Uh, and see how 
even though somehow this Greek revolt interested Bashar Shahab, considering what had happened to his father, how mistrustful this wily man would have been of his so-called Greek potential allies. Now, it's also said that the Greeks had sent an invitation to the chief of the Druzes to unite his forces to the Christian standard. Now, considering that the Druze were allied to the Ottomans, considering that Shahab was a former Druze who was considered a religious renegade and did not get along with the rest of the Druze, that was a rookie mistake to make by a group of Greeks that possibly had not done their research properly. Yeah. So for this reason, um, seeking help from Bashar Shahab's rivals seems to have fatally compromised this Greek expedition. Even though he had been in communication with the Greeks and most probably in his own ambiguous way intimated to them that they may possibly welcome at the appropriate junction, in due course, in the fullness of time, he became afraid of local repercussions uh, of the Greek intervention. As a result, he did the opposite. He immediately mobilized troops to dislodge the Greeks from their position. And these Greeks, surprised, taken off guard, no supply lines, no support within the country, um, no aid, retreated back into their ships. But the landing did have serious repercussions for the Christians of the region. A few days after the Greek withdrawal on the 23rd of March, 1826, after the departure of the uh, Greeks, an Ottoman lieutenant arrived with nearly 500 Albanian irregular forces and he wreaked havoc among the Beiruti Christians. The idea was that they were all held to be collectively responsible for the, uh, for the attempt of the Greeks to raise revolt in Lebanon because after all, they were Orthodox Christians, the Greeks were Orthodox Christians, they were the same thing, there was collective responsibility, and therefore punitive measures would apply. And that's something we've got to understand. This, the Greek revolution had effect all through the populations of Asia Minor and beyond. During the time, there were massacres everywhere because the Ottomans were jumpy and they suspected that everyone who was Orthodox Christian was champing at the bit to rid themselves of Ottoman rule, and that the Greeks were showing how that could possibly be done, and they weren't wrong. The only difference was that in the Middle East, as opposed to the Balkans, they were out, no, the Christians were outnumbered by the Muslims, and they were not in the position to be able to revolt in the way that possibly the Greeks, the Serbs, or the Bulgarians later on were. But the running theme in the whole thing is that everyone suffered these really, really terrible massacres. So according to uh, the British consul again, John Barker, the inhabitants suffered more in their property from these undisciplined troops than in the invasion of the Greeks had inflicted upon them. And the Christian part of the population without distinction of Latin, Maronite or Greek was pursued and persecuted in the most merciless manner by the established authorities, while the Europeans themselves were not secure as well from the effects of the insolence and rapacity of the soldiery. Now, a, a French merchant and uh, American missionary under British protection felt the direct impact uh, of random violence when local troops forcibly entered their dwellings. So not only the Rum Christians, the Greek Christians who were defenseless, but also Europeans were targeted in this general frenzy. The order from the Ottomans was Malay, go crazy, just punish, loot, pillage, do whatever you can. And it reminds us of similar stories being told in the 1922 massacres in Zmirni, where uh, many Europeans and people under European protection also fell victim to an enraged and crazed mob with orders to uh, destroy. These gentlemen and their families, he says again, were put in fear of their lives, maltreated and robbed. And only with great difficulty were the European consuls able to repel the insolent attempts, as John Barker calls them, of the attackers and protect the Rayaz in their service from sharing the fate of other Christians whose houses, and most importantly, from a lucrative point of view, silk plantations were confiscated and all that could be seized were reduced to beggary after having been tortured for the purpose of extorting from them these sums which it was impossible for them to raise 
by the immediate sale of all their effects. Let's, for this, the purposes of tonight, juxtapose the word raya from what's happening. Raya is an Arabic term, which is also used in the Ottomans, uh, in, in the Ottoman time, and it originally means cattle, because in the predominant viewpoint of that time, Christians were called cattle, and as a result, yes, they enjoyed protected status as people of the book in Islamic law, but they were cattle. What do you do with cattle? You raise them, you feed them. When you look after them, you allow them to multiply, but you corral them. When you need to milk them, you milk them. When you need their meat, you kill some of them. And that's a really stark etymological understanding of how the ruling faction saw these Christians and how any pretext, under any pretext, you could, even though these people were not responsible for what had happened. It was the Greeks who had landed there, loot, pillage, take away their goods, enrich yourselves by them, because that was the way they saw the world. That was their uh, worldview. From the word raya, as I said, doesn't mean slave like a lot of Greeks think it does. It actually means cattle. Now, these arbitrary and unwarranted acts of reprisal against the Christians by the Ottomans, uh, as a result of this uh, Ill, ill-conceived uh, Greek landing in Beirut, destroyed any modus vivendi equilibrium existing between the various dominations in uh, Western Syria. Um, as people of the region have long memories, um, the Shahab and Jumblat families, for example, are still major players in uh, the politics of Lebanon today, I should add. For example, the third president of the uh, Lebanese Republic, uh, Fuad Shahab, who there is, uh, was a member of the uh, Shahab family, descending from the Hazir based Maronite line of Hassan, Bashar's brother, uh, as was the former Prime Minister Khalid Shahab, who descended from uh, a Sunni branch of the family. It's a family that transcends religious differences, just shows you how complicated these things are. And also we know that direct descendants of Bashir live in Turkey. They're known as the Paksoy family due to Turkish restrictions on non-Turkish surnames. And we know that the Jumblat family are leaders of the Druze uh, in Lebanon. So some have argued that this singular attempt to bring Syria into the Greek War of Independence sparked off a chain of events that led to internecine fighting and conflict, which ultimately is the root cause of the Lebanese civil war and possibly the conflicts raging in the region today. As a postscript, a member of the Shahab family has also got a connection with the uh, Greek community of Melbourne because one Travis Shahab, uh, a distant descendant of the Shahab family, actually attended Elphington Grammar back in the 90s. So there you go, a bit of trivia. A um, bit of uh, history coming home and uh, appropriating uh, us appropriating that for uh, tonight's purposes. Now, if there is a final word, I think, it goes to Khadzi Mikhailis Dalyanis, who, not content with leading one failed landing, tries his hand at another. Lebanon didn't work, but it wasn't his fault. It's all the fault of those pesky Lebanese. Um, he returns to Greece. He fights in the Battle of Falurum in 1827. And in January 1828, he becomes the leader of an expeditionary force. He loves expeditions, this guy, um, to assist the faltering uprising in Crete. Crete was already always rising and all these rises were always being put down. Um, in an attempt to revive the revolution there, Dalyanis uh, lands with 700 men, 600 on foot, 100 with horses and mules, they land in Ramvusa on the 5th of January, 1928, 1828, sorry, but decide to restart their expedition from Sfakia. And in March, he takes possession of the Frango Castello uh, Castle, a uh, 14th century Venetian fortification in the Sfakia region. And the local Ottoman ruler, uh, Mustafa Naili Pasha, gathers an army of 8,000 men in order to suppress the revolt. The castle's defense was doomed, uh, and Mustafa's Ottoman force of 8,000 men and 300 cavalry arrive on the 13th of May. After several days, the fortress falls back into Ottoman hands and Dalyanis perishes along with 385 of his men. 
Mustafa's force lost 800 men, and the few men who remained named at the fort continue to resist for a few days, but there's no point. It's all over. Now, it's said that Khadzi Mikhail Zdalyanis uh, was buried by a nun at the nearby monastery of Ayus Karalambos, and Mustafa's Turkish troops were ambushed on their return at a nearby gorge by a group of Cretan freedom fighters from Sfakya, and his force suffered 1,000 casualties. Now, these Cretan freedom fighters, according to local law, had warned Dalyanis, you know what, you're a foreigner, you don't know your way around here, let us show you how to do it. Dalyanis was, no, 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 I've got my conventional force, I'm going to railroad through the whole thing, and obviously, in true mainland Grecian style, he didn't listen to the people on the ground, hence tragedy. So, wrapping it up slowly, perhaps the broader point of the exercise um, is to point out that at the time of the revolution, the horizons of the Greek world were both narrow, but also a lot broader and a lot more complicated than we've been led to believe in our uh, historical discourse. While the captains of Rumeli were tied to the boundaries of the Armatolikia, and this is an interesting point, in, in Moria, there were the Kotsambasides and there were the uh, Oplarchigi, and they had their own defined spheres of interest. In Stere Ailada, the captains were the former Armatoli of Ali Pasha. They had taken the Armatolika, the area of influence from Ali Pasha, and they were vying to retain those feudal uh, areas under their control. That's how that worked. They were very sensitive. They were called the Aftochthones. They were very sensitive to the Eterochthones, Greeks from other unredeemed parts of the Greek world who were coming down in search of position, um, employment, and there was this conflict who is Greek, who is entitled to enjoy the privileges of the Greek state. Now, it just so happens that while everyone did the, fam the, the fighting, most of the strategy was uh, was planned by Eterochthoni, by Greeks from outside those liberated areas, from Fanario, who had administrative experience in uh, um, Ali Pasha's uh, little kingdom appanage, if you like, especially in Yanina. Um, Koletis was one, he was from uh, Ali, Ali Pasha's doctor and had extensive diplomatic experience. Another was Mavro Kordatos, Um They conceived of a Greece which defied borders and had um, basically existed wherever there were Greeks and wherever there was memory of Greeks. Um, and viewed from this perspective and the experience gained by peripatetic Greeks in various armies or trading, daring to dream of strategic victory to strike at the heart of the Ottomans. So it doesn't seem far-fetched. It was the logistics which was the problem. Now, after all, Muhammad Ali tried it uh, successfully. He invaded Syria, got as far as, uh, as the interior of Asia Minor before the uh, world powers told him to go back home and gave him as a reward and semi-independent Egypt. And so did General Allenby. During the First World War, his strategy was to attack the Ottomans through Syria. Um, what they found out, which the Greeks didn't get a chance to, is that it is one thing to capture that sensitive area, but it's quite another thing to hold it, and that's something which has plagued Western colonial powers ever since. So an audacious plan, a plan to rouse the people of the region, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, didn't work out as planned with severe repercussions for the Orthodox of the region. And the final postscript on the Orthodox of the region, who generally identify as Arab, some of them identify as the Aramaic speakers as Syriac, and some of them, interestingly enough, recently are beginning, especially diasporan, uh, Antiochian Orthodox, are beginning to assert a Greek identity, which is fascinating. Uh, they believe that they are descendants of Greeks who settled in the region since the time of Alexander and later, because we know that Antioch was a very important, vibrant part of the Byzantine Empire. We know that um, it was a very important part of uh, the Christian faith. People such as St. John Chrysostom uh, lived in that region. Uh, the theology of the Orthodox Church was created in that region. The Psalms, the singing, the troparia, were all written according to the Syriac tradition in that region, is a very important historical area where the Greek identity was developed. Some of these uh, people today are espousing that. They speak Arabic, they speak English, they espouse a Greek uh, identity. I don't know how you can do that, um, but they do do that. They feel very strongly about it. And let's see how that will develop 
in the future. So much for the Greeks of Lebanon and Syria, uh, Yipon. A uh, topic which I think was worth discussing because, as I say, we look at generally the Greek Revolution as something pertaining only to Greece. We forget about its ramifications elsewhere, and we forget how this concatenation of events, the Greek Revolution, revolts in other parts of the, of the uh, empire, in Serbia, in Bulgaria, with the Bulgarian atrocities, one of the first genocides, if you like. All these things lead to a hypersensitivity and a fear of the destruction of the Ottoman Empire, the breaking away of that Ayades, which completely challenged their worldview and caused them to react violently, and I would argue still violently up until the present day. So a chain of events creates a policy and an attitude towards a people and certain claims that persists even today. Pondian genocide, invasion of Cyprus, invasion of Syria today and beyond. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dean, for um, another fascinating presentation. Um, and we are open to questions that you can submit through either the chat or the comment function. Um, on the question of um, trivialities, um, a few decades ago, I believe we had a police commission here in Victoria called Delianus. I wonder if there's any connection to the uh, Delianus in your story, just, uh, just a side note. Um, let me kickstart off the questioning. Um, on a few occasions you did mention the Jews. Under Islamic law, under the Ottomans then, how were the, the Jews perceived? Because they weren't quite Christian, they weren't Christian, they weren't Muslim, not exactly sort of people of the book. What status did they have, legal status they have within the Ottoman Empire? And if I can also extend that question to another group you didn't mention, the Alevites, sort of not being Sunni Muslims, did they have a different status under the Ottoman Empire? Well, the Druze were heretics. And when you're a heretic and you're subject to persecution, there's only thing, one thing you can do, which is to uh, fortify yourself up in the mountains and make sure that you're, you're somewhere where no one can get you. And that's what the Druze did. The Druze carved themselves an area up in the mountains where they were impregnable, where the Ottomans could not go, and they were able to deal with them from that position, from a position of strength. They remind me a lot of the Suryotas, an extremely warlike people, a people that maintained their independence right up until the time of Ali Pasha, simply because no one could get to them. The Alawites were different because the Alawites are sort of a Shia type of uh, arrangement. And then there's the... You, we know that the, per the Persians next door are Shia, and the Alawites are seen as a Persian fifth column, if you like. So they are considered with great mistrust. Uh, there are periodical massacres of those tribes as well. But in times when the Persians are asserting their own ascendancy, they're also protected because it's politic to do so, so as not to offend the Persians. So they're caught in the middle, if you like, and it's a really good question. It just shows you how complex the Middle East is and how we, with our increasingly Western eyes, uh, forget to um, and, and neglect to identify the differences and the fractures and the fault lines within what we see as a monolithic Islamic area. It isn't. That's no, true. It's very heterodox. And, um Try and putting try and putting Syria back together again, almost impossible. <laughs> it's a very fluid situation. So yeah. Okay. Um, let's continue with the questions. Uh, a question from Conspiropolis. Uh, to what extent did the Greek Revolution provide inspirations for Greek pirates and adventurers to expand outside the Greek speaking world? I'm not sure that it did. Uh Costa. I think that Greek pirates were always looking for an opportunity to expand um, their horizons outside the Greek-speaking world. We know that Greek pirates were notorious in running the uh, running through the uh, embargo of the British during the Napoleonic Wars, and they were supplying the French army, and they were generally wherever uh, they could get a job. For example, I've been reading recently about the Battle of Derna in Libya, where Greek mercenaries fought for the Americans in the first American battle outside America, the first foreign battle, the first foreign intervention, uh, where they took over the city of Derna in, in Libya against the Karamanli family, which were descendants of Greek slaves. Uh, and um, 
yeah, they did so and they were rewarded for their efforts. They were considered very faithful, very good fighters for the American cause. And the Greeks went everywhere. And they did that before the revolution, after the revolution, wherever they could make a buck, the way we do today as a diasporan people. I think that's part of our blood. It's always been the same. I don't think the revolution had any significant effect in inspiring that. That was always a phenomenon running through Greece and, and the Greek discourse, I think. So when there was an arbitrage opportunity, they took advantage of it. <laughs> that's, uh... well, but that's, that, that's, that's what people do. That's what diasporan people do. They migrate for work. Uh, they take advantage of situations. That's the reason why you, you were able to find Greek eateries all the way through the, down the Nile in Africa right up until the Congo. And people like Evelyn Waugh, the famous writer in the, uh, in the 50s, writes about being lost in the wilds of the Congo and coming across a Greek, uh, a Greek restaurant in the middle of nowhere says, wherever I went in the deepest, darkest Africa, always come across a Greek to help me. Okay. Um, we've got a question here sort of unrelated to the topic, but that doesn't matter. And uh, um, can you share with us some of the inspiration from the children's book? Okay. Um, so you're happy for me to answer that question, uh, moderator, even though it's not on the topic? Yeah. Okay. No, we don't have any other questions, so you might as well. Look, I, I, I really should have been to plug, plug my book. That's fine. Basically, the, it was a lockdown like this one last year. And uh, I was sitting at home, and my daughter says to me, Baba, you're always writing. You're never writing anything for kids. So I said, go and pick up a pencil paper, come sit with me. And I started writing. And I had this idea from a long time ago about a magic kemenje, magic pondiaki lira, that somehow does something. And I didn't know what to do with it. It was in the back of my mind for years. And then suddenly it came to me. How would you talk about traumatic events to kids? And what is the function of a paramithi? Paramithi, in the traditional sense, it sits next to the myth. Yeah, It's opposite to the myth. But in the, in the traditional Greek culture, paramithia meant consolation. And children... I think, revert to the fantasy world in order to understand and in order to cope with the real world. So I want to write a story about that. It's a story set during the time of the genocide. It's not gratuitous. It doesn't create violence. It, but it, and it has the effect of removing children from the awful reality of that period, and, but at the same time providing an opportunity for people reading the book to understand what those events were. So it's about a little girl called Sumela who basically is accompanied on a very strange journey by magic Kemenje, whose music um, finds a way of bringing her back to her mother. And it's a bilingual, it's a bilingual Greek English book. And again, um, I'm very passionate about children's books. I always have been. And I'm noticing lately that a lot of people are trying to write books for the younger members of our community. See a lot of mums uh, doing that. There was a, a lady in Adelaide recently uh, doing that. Um, another book's been uh, The ABC of Easter is another one which has come out recently. And it's generally mums. And I'm thinking this is great because for the first time in a very long time, we're considering as a Greek community, what do we want our kids to read? And how can we write our own children's books for them? And then the debate is, well, what kind of values do we want to pass on to those kids? What is the identity of the Australian Greek that we can encapsulate in those books? It's an interesting debate. A lot of the elements are religious um, that I'm finding in some of these books. In mine, I'm trying to keep a balance, I'm trying to keep it historical, um, religious, um, traditional, but also maintain an interesting story because I think that children's books also need to be well written and it's bilingual. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks um, for the plug. And it's really great that it's bilingual, I think. That's um, the added advantage of it as well. And I'm so, yeah. Um, Thanks for that. We've got another question that's come through. Um, what about the Orthodox Christians, even the non-Greek speaking ones in Egypt and generally in the Middle East? How did they see the revolution? Well, you, it's with very nervous eyes because remember, um, it's very easy, and I say this without wishing to uh, belittle the achievements of the revolutionaries in Peloponnesus, it's very easy to raise yourself in revolt when there are not many Turks on the ground and when such Turks as exist live in cities, whereas the majority of the population lives in the countryside, can retreat to the mountains and hide at any time. You can't do that in the Middle East. You can't do that in Egypt, where everyone lives along that narrow strip of land 
along the Nile, okay? And where you are vastly outnumbered by the Muslims. And let's consider why the Greek revolution never took hold in the interior of Asia Minor. It's the same thing. These places were predominantly Muslim. The Christians could not uh, rise in revolt without severe damage being done to them. And we remember that at the time of the Greek revolution, um, severe massacres took place against the Greeks in Constantinople, in Zmirni, in Trapezunda, in many other urban centers. As a result, there were punitive measures. So I would say that, I mean, the Greek general, if you like, ideological view of history is, oh, they would have been champing at the bit and just waiting for a moment to rise. That did not happen, yeah? And in most parts of Greece, that did not happen. Didn't they have the safety in numbers. Um, yeah. No, they didn't have the safety in numbers. They didn't have the motivation. It was hard. At the end of the day, self-preservation, making sure that you and your family are safe are the most important thing. And that in many situations, people rose in revolt when they were provoked, when the Turks started massacring them and they had no choice and they had nothing to lose. So in terms of... Uh, and the other thing is this. Nationalism, this idea that we are Greek, and that's where the Greek Revolution is important, that was something that was born out of that revolution. Because as I say, 400, 500 years of Ottoman rule and in the Middle East longer, okay? They'd already had the Arabs before that. They were taught to consider themselves by their religion only. They did not have an ethnic identity. They had a religious identity, just as the Muslims in those regions had a Muslim identity. They don't develop a national identity until the colonialists come after the First World War, and create one for them, Lawrence of Arabia. There's that famous uh, scene in the movie where uh, where uh, Abu Dai says, you know, I, I know this tribe, I know that tribe, but the Arabs, I don't know who they are. They didn't have this idea that they were an ethnic identity. That came later. So this idea that they'll all rise up and identify with Greeks, no, didn't work. And even now, there are problems with that kind of approach at least. And the nation state also... The nation state is also a very new concept as well. And um, well, well, it is, it is. And, and, and that's why you get chaos in these regions because they don't identify with the geographical borders with that idea, that commonality, that they are one people because they're diverse and they're internal fractures. You take Iraq, the Sunnis hate the Shia. The Kurds are not Arabs. The Assyrians are not Arabs or Kurds. Yeah? Mm. And these are, these are all people lumped in one nation. I mean, imagine. Syria is the same. Uh, Egypt's got the Copts. It's got the Nubians. I mean, these are things that, that, that we don't, as, as Western educated people or with the Western perspective, we don't view, we can't see these fault lines, but they're significant. Just as just the same way that we tend to write the Arvanites and the Vlachi out of the revolution. When we, when we consider those populations, we consider them as, you know, just part of the Greek cause and that's it. But we don't consider where they had a separate perspective. No, we've completely written the Jews out of the Greek revolution and they suffered massacres at the hands of the Greeks during that time. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks for that. Um, I think we might bring the uh, presentation to a close. Kusadini, uh, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Very well. Nice to And also, don't forget next week's seminar by Yanni Cartledge on the uh, Heos Massacre, British Humanitarianism and Heos Immigration. So um, good evening, everyone. Um, best of luck over the next few days and uh, we'll touch base again next week.